Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Sure. And we're going to go ahead, uh, just uh, briefly hit on the bill, but uh, then we'll go ahead and deal with the amendments before we get into the meat of the discussion. Okay. So, um, members, um, I'm here two days in a row, civil, civil laws. So, nice for me as a non-attorney to be in front of you again. I am presenting a bill that I started to work on last year before COVID um, about sexual assault and termination of leases. And I worked with Star, Morgan LaMondra is at the table with me because I found out this is particularly a problem for students. Um, sometimes students are able to get out of their leases and sometimes they're not. And so we needed to give them a way after a sexual assault if they do need to move to be able to do so. Of course, this is way more relevant based on all the testimony that's been happening in this Capitol. Um, even though I started working on it before all of the stories of the sexual assault and the cover-up at LSU happened. And so um, I worked very closely with STAR, but I also worked very closely with the apartment association so that they're comfortable, so that the owners of the apartment buildings and the landlords feel like they're protected and that there's a proper way to terminate a lease. So there's a couple amendments that should be publicly posted that's, that staff is going to enter if you want to read those to, to put the bill in its full form yes uh, miss Pierdel, uh, uh thank you chairman miller um members this is amendment set 1117 and it's posted online um they're both substantive amendment one specifies that a qualified third party includes a prosecuting attorney or investigating law enforcement officer who has a personal involvement in the investigation or prosecution of any criminal case relative to sexual assault and to the sexual assault. And then Amendment 2 is a, is um, adds that the lessor is entitled to the immediate eviction of a sexual assault offender upon presenting the court with reasonable documentation of the assault. Oh, thank you, Ms. Pirro. I'll go ahead and offer uh, Amendment Set 1117. Uh, and we can question on what these amendments mean when we get on the meat of the bill. So are there any objections to the adoption of Amendment Set 1117? Uh, Seeing none, those amendments are adopted. Okay. On. And and so really, the, like I said, the purpose of this bill is simply to allow a survivor of sexual assault to be able to move if if that's deemed to be necessary through their um, counseling experience and through their experience with re making a report. Um, the survivors often have flashbacks or nightmares. Sometimes it affects their ability to go to school or work, and sometimes then the perpetrator then knows where they live so the purpose of this is to protect survivors and um, I do have Morgan LaMondra here with star with me but I also want to make make the point that I also have Jennifer Ansardi who's here with the Apartment Association Maxwell Sirigello with Louisiana Fair Housing and Katie Hunter Lowry with Louisiana Survivors for Reform but most importantly um, I have about seven LSU students here who have been following this bill and and I, I think more importantly than hearing from me from me is hearing from them because this does affect students for the most part this is a situation that is more common in the student population and um, so I'm happy to answer questions um, I know you all know um, Miss LaMondra from STAR as well um, I, w I would like to give the students an opportunity to, to testify because I know some of them have to go back to class. <laughs> so um, whatever the chairman prefers as far as you want me to answer questions first or. Uh, um, right now we don't have any questions, but uh, just briefly describe how, what, what does the bill do? How has it changed the law as it stands now? I'm going to let Morgan speak to that a little bit. Sure. Good, good morning or good afternoon, I'm not sure yet, but it's my name is Morgan LaMondre and I'm the legal director at STAR. And essentially what the bill does is to allow for early lease termination if someone is sexually assaulted. The sexual assault would have to occur after they executed the lease. You can't enter into an agreement, you know, prior and then sort of have cause to break your lease. Uh, for a sexual assault that happened before. We currently have a law that allows this for domestic violence, but it does not extend to those who are in non-intimate relationships and are sexually assaulted. So where we do see um, a lot of requests 
for these. And I would say, for the most part, landlords do work with survivors, especially if they have been sexually assaulted um, in or near their apartments. But every now and then, there are times when they are not let out of leases. So this is a bill that sort of, you know, will allow them to be um, to, to have early lease termination. A survivor of sexual assault would have to give notice to the landlord at least 60 days after the sexual assault in order to do this. And then there would be, in a sense, um, they're on the hook, I guess, for at least 30 days of rent from the point that they give notice. So that, you know, that way there is some sort of time for the landlord if they need to fill fill the apartment or something along those lines. It's pretty similar to what we currently have in the domestic violence bill, which I think Maxwell can provide you all with um, the history of that. The two amendments that were made today, uh, there was a concern that the, the way we had it in there was if you're um, a law enforcement officer who investigated the case, if there was a report of sexual assault or the attorney that's prosecuting the case. We just had in the original bill a pros you know, a prosecuting attorney or investigating law enforcement officer. Obviously, as attorneys, we're we have strict legal ethics. We're not gonna have attorneys um or I would hope law enforcement officers just lying and saying they're familiar with this. But this language that we added makes it clear that it can't just be any random law enforcement officer or any random uh, assistant district attorney. It has to be the person who's who investigated the case or it has to be the attorney that's prosecuting the case in order to um, be able to sign off. And then the other amendment that was introduced was something that the Apartment Association had said that they would like uh, because their position was that if they received notice that one of their tenants has maybe, um, you know, been flashing another tenant, so that tenant then can get out of their lease, well, they wanted the ability to, if they have the documentation that says another one of their tenants was that sexual offender who was like flashing residents, they wanted the ability to evict the sexual offender. It would have to be the person who was on the documentation of that specific incident. It can't just be somebody who may happen to be a sex offender or something in the apartment. But their position was that, you know, if if they kept doing it to other residents and they're letting them out of leases, well, obviously they they need some sort of protection to be able to protect further residents. So that was something we were happy to agree to. And I would say, you know, the pandemic was kind of a blessing in disguise because we brought this bill last year, but through throughout the year, we were able to work with the apartment association. They worked with all of their stakeholders, which I think Jennifer can tell you who all was involved in this process. And this resulted in this bill, which all of us can live with and it will help survivors. Thank you, uh, Representative Amade for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. It is still morning so far. Okay. okay. Um, I probably should have put my light on uh, when we were handling the amendment. Um, since I had read the bill and the amendment ahead of time, in my mind, the bill was already amended, so I missed that okay. moment. But okay. but um, I just had two questions. Um, one of them is this. Since uh, it, it, it seems to me, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that the majority of sexual assault victims are female. How do we answer people who are going to say that um, passing this might cause landlords to be hesitant to lease to females? So I would say that would fall. I mean, the landlords can't discriminate right. based on the basis of sex, right? Um, I would say I, I hear you, but I guess I don't think that would really be a concern that... Um, I don't know. I mean, they can't discriminate based on the sex of the person that is leasing the landlord. I would say that um, there are certain... So the, the current federal and state laws then should protect against this already. Right, right. Okay. I mean, but I, and Maxwell may be able to speak more to that question, but I guess, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a hard question to answer just so, you know, I, I know people people say, oh, well, I don't want to hire people or, or things because there's this 
I mean, we need to work to support survivors in many different ways so we can have a culture that does not tolerate or, um, you know, make it easy for sexual violence to be committed. But with that being said, yes, I don't think that landlords would be able to discriminate on the basis of sex. Right. So and we already have the law. Representative Omni, I, I can add that in my research to put this bill together, that most landlords are are very amenable to helping out this the survivors. This is really being put in place f for them to have some ability when that there is that landlord out there who um, is worried about you know how their income is going to keep coming through. It's a business for them as well. So exactly. I do think that most landlords are very understanding about this and work with the survivors right. and this law will protect to, those who who don't have that protection yes and i just wanted to air that in a public hearing because as you know even landlords have had a tough year in 2020 yes and that's that is why we worked very closely <laughs> with them and and presenting this bill. right and right. some of them rely on their their rental income as their literal income yes um so my second question was this the um with the amendment mentioning the sexual assault offender um what about this is an action that's going to be allowed you know the, the landlord breaking the lease um, for a person who is in this case being accused but hasn't actually gone through court yet no. so does this fall in the same category as simply complaints among tenants like say if your neighbor is constantly making noise or dumping garbage or what have you um, or are we getting into trouble here by dealing with people who haven't been through due process? So I think that the first thing is that this is, it's only going to potentially occur if the survive, the survivor's lease, the survivor is requesting for their lease to be terminated. Now they may or may not have the name. If the name is known, the documentation requires them to put the name down. What this would allow is if upon like a basically the landlord does not have to evict somebody if they're named in that documentation i would say majority of where we see things it's not um offenders are not necessarily living in the same complex but but, but if they were living in the same apartment then it would fall under the domestic violence laws we already have right n not necessarily if they're not in an intimate relationship Okay, so, so it's not enough to just be simply residing in the same apartment. Right. Okay, right. now we're talking about the apartment complex, not the same apartment necessarily, but maybe across the hall or in the right. next building. Okay. Right, and I think Jennifer could probably speak more to that about what they would want to be able to do regarding that. But I think that, you know, with the documentation, the reasonable documentation and outlining, I mean, it is sworn of under oath, the survivor would be penalized if, you know, he or she was lying under that. So I think that, you know, as far as the action of the person who was um, presented there, there could be a way, I guess, for that to be sorted out. But I think that that's where the apartment association in order to, once they receive notice that there is some sort of um, threat on their property, they do already, I think in some instances in their leases with people, they're able to maybe take some sort of action. But I think that other than that, you know, Jennifer may be able to speak more to that. So they may already have some clause in their lease that says that they, they could, the landlord could choose to terminate a lease for any number of reasons. Um, so this may not be a violation at all uh, to, to include this also. And um, I don't know, not to take up too much time, but the reason I was thinking about this is because years ago I had served on our parish council and we were dealing with situations of um, um, disorderly placekeeping and this didn't have anything to do with individuals with apartments this had to do with um, let's say bar rooms where every weekend there were fights and every weekend the police had to be called um, if the neighbors in, in that area were tired of all the the excess activity they could take steps under a disorderly placekeeping ordinance to where if you had so many people who had been arrested at this bar room in a certain period of time, the bar room might be um, made to close down. But that was the debate. 
they were arrested, but they weren't necessarily convicted for fighting in the streets or what have you. So that's that's why this is coming to mind here, because here um, one tenant is saying someone did something. So are we getting into a gray area, allowing the landlord to take action to remove the other person from their own home when they've been accused but not convicted yet? So Right, and I will say that Currently, we have this process for the domestic violence bill where, you know, they may, the survivor may not have even reported to police. So I think we already have a process in place that outlines that. And I think, once again, Maxwell can speak to the current process, but I don't know that it would necessarily um, rise to that. Or, Or I think there's a way through this statute that, I mean, that that is potentially addressed, but it is possible that somebody could be evicted and they haven't been convicted. That is true. Yeah. So, so um, I would just like to discuss that to clear up the matter. Because yeah. Because those like, are the questions that I get. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do, you. do you need somebody else to come up to the table to explain that for you? She was mentioning Maxwell. If yeah. he has any more to I don't add. know if it's Maxwell or if it's... Um, somebody else i think maxwell can talk to how it maxwell works with the dv bill which is basically in line okay. would you like to come up? Uh, yeah okay i'll let maxwell yeah, come explain that help. i appreciate it thank you representative freeman if you or or one of one of y'all you make some room there i don't know if we're finished questioning uh with you but uh i know uh, let's go ahead but we can let maxwell make some room there Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Maxwell Chardulo, and I'm with the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center. Um, and so, Representative Amade, thank you for your concerns. So um, I appreciate those. I can say that, um, just to give a little background, so we were uh, in this committee six years ago and spent a significant amount of time, um, both with members of the committee uh, and the Apartment Association, um, to create a bill to protect survivors of domestic violence from being evicted or otherwise punished for something that their abuser did. Um, and so that has been in place uh, for the past um, six years. And then similarly, these protections already exist both for survivors of domestic violence and survivors of sexual assault um, in, federal pro- in uh, federally subsidized properties. And so you're talking about them existing for all properties in Louisiana for the past six years, but then also for about a quarter of all rental properties in the state, um, they've existed for years before that through the Violence Against Women Act. Um, so this is a, a, a te- time-tested process, more or less, is sort of the point that I'm getting to. Um, so we haven't seen that it, uh, it, dis- it discourages landlords from renting to women. Um, that's not something that domestic violence providers have, have um, reported to us, and they've said that the law is working relatively well. Um, and, and I think the additional protection we have in here for anyone who uh, is named in this declaration is that this is a, a much, there's more scrutiny here. It's a, it's a more significant process than just a complaint or an accusation between neighbors because someone has to go and create this certified process um, with someone who is an expert. And that's a process that we created with the Apartment Association um, around the domestic violence bill. And we, pat, we, we based it on the process that already exists in the Federal Violence Against Women Act because it has a track record of working well. And, and I can say as, as an advocate for uh, as a housing advocate, as someone who maybe is most likely to defend people against eviction, it's something that we're comfortable with. Okay, so you don't see any problem um, where someone could, well, I guess you could probably make a lawsuit out of anything you want, but um, someone could say, well, my landlord is evicting me because someone has accused me of something, but I haven't even gone to court yet so I'm not convicted, therefore now I have no place to live and I'm not declared guilty yet. So that was that was what I was looking for clarification on. Yeah, no, I see the concern and that's why we tried to build in this process with a, um, with a very clear and sort of limited, this only applies in limited circumstances and it only applies when a survivor is willing to take the step to go forward and identify themselves, which we know is a huge hurdle to begin with, but then also go through the certification process. And we feel like that provides a decent enough, uh, definitely a good enough protection to to go 
and, and make that step and, and allow someone to be evicted. Okay, so so the the process that the survivor follows by filing all the, the appropriate paperwork according to what's outlined here, that's what um, answers the the question of well, what about someone who hasn't been officially convicted yet? Yeah, we think it's it would significantly discourage any sort of frivolous you know uh, situation okay, that good. yeah it, it creates good. I mean. Uh, honestly, this is any process that is uh, must be initiated by a victim um, shortly after an assault. Uh, is, there's a pretty high barrier there to begin with. So, someone who's going through this, um, I think we're we're not so worried about the right. the assaulter. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to discuss all this with a non-attorney. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer other questions, but otherwise thank, I'll, I'll defer back. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I was trying to multitask. You're, you're with the Fair Housing? That's right, the Louisiana and, Fair Housing Action and, Center. And first name is Maxwell, last name is? Chardillo. Chardillo, okay. I just don't want to mispronounce that. But uh, all right, thank you. Um, I want to hear from uh, Jennifer Ansardi with the Apartments Association of Louisiana. I know we've got some others with some questions, but I, I want to hear... Uh, <laughs> from her and then we have some student uh, students who want to testify and I know they have to get going so uh, good morning good morning Mr. Chairman and or good afternoon no we're still morning we're still morning oh, God it doesn't seem good morning it's, it's <laughs> dark outside that's you why. and to the committee members I'm Jennifer Ansardi representing the Apartment Association and I have with me Tammy Esponge who's on the side who's the Apartment Association of Louisiana's uh, Association executive and we just wanted to come to the table to say that um, we thank representative Freeman and Morgan for working with us they we gave them a, a long laundry list of um, concerns and they they worked with us on every single one and as was expressed earlier we did um, institute the domestic violence law about, I guess it was six years ago and that was 64 amendments during session we did we did all this uh, work in advance to, to, to try to help um, put things in a very narrow, um, manageable uh, posture so that we can help the, those victors, the victims that are truly in need while, all, while also protecting the landlords and property owners from unintended consequences which tend to crop up in a bill as complex as it is. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. We think it's, it's, it's good. Thank you. Re Representative Freeman, is your bill for uh, for anyone at the table here? Yeah. Uh, okay. You, for representative events, uh, for <laughs> Miss Ansardi. I'm giving sorry. Giving a promotion? <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave, I would be giving uh, Glenn a, a demotion. Uh, representative Freeman for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing this bill. I, I got a couple of issues that I just trying to get squ square in my head. And I understand the significance of the domestic, I mean, the uh, sexual assault issue as being, you know, it's at the forefront of our thought right now with the LSU issues and all that. And I get that. My question is, what about folks who have home invasions and they're badly beaten and they got to have to go to the hospital and maybe people who are carjacked right outside their apartment or there's a murder outside their apartment? At what point do we consider their problems and saying well should they be allowed out their lease so my question maybe not so much for you rep yeah. but for miss ansardi are are y'all gonna then say it's okay to break leases for those kind of problems too i mean i know because sec the sexual assault thing is pretty clear and and it's a big problem and, and i and i'm very very sympathetic to that but i want to know about others who are victims i mean we talk about survivors they're surviving crime as well and maybe violent crime are y'all going to be just as um easy you know workable with that too well um if there's a crime there is already provisions in the lease that would provide for an extinguisher of the lease and tammy might be able to speak more knowledge about the pr provisions of the lease but I can see there's a fine balance that, and that's what we've tried to really work with the advocates on making sure that it's very narrow and focused because of course it, you know, it could get out of hand. And I don't think that my members would want us to support something that 
you're describing a carjacking on the street they have to get it out of the lease and that's why we were very involved <coughs> in the process because you know um it has to be very narrow circumstance with um certification <coughs> to prove that it is what it is um to give us comfort because like you said that that would be opening a huge can of worms and very problematic for us we would not and again, that, that, and that's just really the point I'm going to make. And, and again, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to the sexual assault issue. But when you start allowing contracts to be broken and things for one group and other groups have similar issues, I mean, it, it's different in a sense of one sexual assault, one's a battery, one may be a murder. I get it. Mm -hmm. But they're still mentally affected. So are we now opening up Pandora's box to to start doing that I, that's just my concern i'm not saying i'm against the bill i'm just saying when you start start moving the bar sometimes you can't stop it so I, i'm just concerned about every time we move the bar in a legal sense that are we can are we creating some down the road unintended consequences that's my only concern thank you for answering thank my you. question and I, and I appreciate your concerns representative freeman but i just want to state that when I brought this bill, this is pre-COVID that I started working on this, it it was with students in mind, and I know that's a big part of the conversation in here right now, because students were the ones most likely to be in a situation where they were sexually assaulted by either someone they didn't know or someone they partially knew and had troubles getting out of their lease, and the domestic violence vi victims of sexual assault were covered from all the work that was done six years ago. So I specifically started looking at it and hearing directly from students, survivors. So I can hear, I'm not a lawyer, but I understand where you might see it opening up in other areas, but we're very specific about this specific change for the survivors of sexual assault. And I, and I appreciate that. And, and, and I do, and look, I have a daughter who's in college, so, and she, she's a renter. I, I get it. Um, I just, of course your bill doesn't limit it to students. It's just a general. It doesn't, but, I, but, it, but I, 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 I did this on behalf of a bunch of students yeah, I understand. when I first started looking at it. I understand. It. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Freeman. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, let's hear from those students, and if y'all wouldn't mind, we'll get uh, two students at a time, and we'll be able to get them uh, here. Uh, let's hear first from Isabel, Isabella Revere uh, and Angelina Cantelli. And just introduce yourself, and who are you, who are you uh, appearing on behalf of, if, if, for, if someone else besides yourself? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Angelina Cantelli. I am the co-president and founder of Tigers Against Sexual Assault, which is a student-led movement on LSU's campus to advocate for the ending of sexual violence on campus through education. Um, so Tigers Against Sexual Assault, like I mentioned, is a student-led movement on LSU's campus. Through my time leading this organization, I've heard countless stories from survivors about their experience of sexual assault and what barriers made it harder to recover afterwards. One thing that consistently comes up is how inhibiting it can be to have to visit, go to class, or live in the same environment where they were assaulted. It is rightfully distressing and can often cause flashbacks when survivors are forced to remain in the same space. Yet, it is not required by Louisiana law to allow survivors to terminate their lease after they have experienced assault. Louisiana law must change to best accommodate those who experience sexual assault. Survivors have already been taken advantage of and made to feel powerless by their abuser. They should not feel powerless against their lease in the law. I'm sure many of you have been aware of what has happened at LSU this year regarding sexual assault. Many of you have also wondered how you as a legislator can use your power to address these issues. As someone on the front lines of doing this work on campus, I'm here to tell you that voting yes on this bill is a tangible change that will positively impact survivors on campus. While Title IX provides a legal foundation for students living on campus to terminate their lease due to sexual assault, 68% of LSU students live off campus and would not be covered by that law. Not to mention 54% of Tulane students live off campus and 77% of Louisiana Tech students live off campus. This bill would not just benefit LSU students, but higher education students across the state. Being forced to live in a home that is a reminder of your trauma can deter a student's willingness to continue staying near campus 
or their ability to adequately, fo adequately focus on school if they do stay. As a student myself, I'm asking you to do what is best for our safety, comfort, and access to education. I am joined here today by several of my peers who all came to show support for this bill and many of whom are watching you from home. This bill is beneficial to survivors and provides a fair timeline and amount of documentation to ensure that this will not be abused by anyone looking to terminate a lease without cause. This bill has been informed by several experts who work with survivors and at housing daily. Louisiana as a whole will benefit from the passing of this bill, improving the safety and comfort of sexual assault survivors brings relief not only to them, but to their families and loved ones. I would say that since this statute um, existed similarly for domestic violence that was passed six years ago, like mentioned, that I don't believe this is opening up a Pandora's box. Um, this is basically reiterating what was done for domestic violence and allowing it for sexual assault, and I think the parameters there are clear. So. Overall, I ask you to show compassion for survivors of sexual assault and to show concern for higher education students across Louisiana. I ask you to please vote yes on this bill. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, committee members, and thank you, Chairman Min Miller, for giving my peers and I the opportunity to speak today. My name is Isabella Rivera, and I'm a sophomore at Louisiana State University from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm here to speak in support of House Bill 375, as this bill makes strides in sexual assault advocacy in the residential field. Back in March of 2020, I was sexually assaulted on LSU's campus, and after filing a police report, the for first and only thing I wanted to do was go home. Home is where I knew nothing could happen to me, and I was surrounded by people whose prime priority was to keep me safe. Luckily, being from Baton Rouge, home is only 15 minutes away. After talking with my parents regarding my safety and mental health, we agreed I would stay home for the rest of the semester, and I would just commute to campus before everything went online weeks later. Where I was living paid, was paid in full up front, and my parents were willing to quote unquote lose that money for the sake of my safety. With that being said, that is not the case for every survivor, as their month to month rent can become a financial burden, especially if they are not living in the space. Everyone should be afforded the opportunity to reside where they feel safe, and an apartment lease should not be an inhibitor to one's safety and recovery. This bill adequately requires victims to provide the documentation to confirm their assault and also requires them to terminate their lease in a timely manner, giving the landlord time to refill the space if necessary. A survivor's priority should be their safety and mental health, not staying in a space because they have to hand in a check every month regardless of circumstances. Now that I have returned to campus in the fall and currently live on campus, the lingering effects of my assault remain. I was assaulted outside of a campus apartment near the center of campus, a building I often have to pass on my daily walk to class or even to get to the student union. Without fail, every time I pass the apartment building, I tense up and walk faster almost to the point where I'm running. It has become a reflex due to a consistent sense of fear that overcomes me as a result of my assault. It's something hard to bear even for a good 45 seconds out of my day, and I could never imagine the pain and trauma of having to sit, live, and sleep in a building where something so heinous as sexual assault happened to someone. Survivors deserve a path to recovery where there is not a day-to-day -day reminder of their assault, and an apartment building that was the scene of the crime can strongly inhibit that recovery by bringing in high senses of anxiety and re-traumatization. I hope you see my perspective as to how House Bill 375 will be beneficial for survivors of sexual assault and aid in their process of recovery if they choose to return home. Thank you. Thank you, and thank both of y'all for uh, being here and sharing your experiences. Appreciate that. So, all right. Uh, Next up, we're going to hear from, uh, I believe, Alexandra Thibodeau and Ricky Bryant. Good morning. Hi, my name is Alexandra Thibodeau, and I'm here to give you my personal experiences relating to House Bill 375. I've not had personal experiences regarding sexual assault with leases, but I can attest to the trauma of sexual assault. Um, some of the things I'm about to say might be triggering. I was enjoying a night with my friends on January 25th, 2020 when I was raped. I was separated from the group and I found myself in a two-door car with three strange men I'd never met. I'm not sure how I ended up there, but I assume I was roofied. They drove across, around campus taking turns abusing me. I had no idea if I'd be let go, if they'd murder me, if they'd keep me locked up somewhere. I didn't know if I'd ever see my family again. I didn't know who these people were and I was terrified for my life. Luckily, I'm here today to tell you my story. By the grace of God, when those men were done abusing me, they hurled me out of the car onto the side of the road on campus. 
In fact, it was in front of my statistics, in front of the building where my statistics class was. I walked to my dorm with no shoes on and I wept. For the rest of the year, I did not attend my statistics class. I couldn't go near the building. I couldn't go down the road without feeling them violate me again and without feeling that fear for my life. A year later, I avoid that building on the road as much as I possibly can. But any time I'm unfortunate enough again to pass it, I feel overwhelmingly unsafe. I can't fathom having to be in the same room, sleep in the same bed, live in the same complex, let alone the same apartment where I was raped. I can't fathom the fear that survivors must feel knowing they must carry on daily activities due to their, inability, to, due to their financial inability to move to a new space. The citizens of Louisiana deserve to feel safe in their homes. They should not be forced to relive those experiences every day. Please support survivors in this bill by including sexual assault as a reason to terminate leasing contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, committee members, and thank you, Chair Miller, uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Yes, morning. Uh, my name is Ricky Bryant, and I'm a junior mass communication major at uh, LSU. And, uh, but I still call my home of Southern Bezier Parish my true home. I know that we often see sexual violence as an issue that only impacts women, but men are affected by it too. I am in support of HB 7375, excuse me, but because I know how much of a struggle it can be to go places that bring back the horrors of an experience with sexual violence. In the spring of 2019, I was sexually assaulted by another student and endured a continual cycle of abuse that sent me on a downward spiral. During and after the cycle of abuse that I endured, I slipped into a reliance on alcohol and drugs to overcome my mountain of emotions I felt every day. Some days finding the motivation to dr and drive to get out of bed was a challenge, and other days I would simply lay in bed until I could push myself to go about my day. On the days that I was able to go about my day, the simplest thing could set me off. The most minuscule thing could remind me of the abuse and trauma that I endured for so long. Passing my abuser's house, going to the bars that my abuser went to, simply entering the LSU Student Union, and so many more little innocent things reminded me of the horrors I had to endure for so long. I cannot imagine how traumatizing it can be for a fellow survivor to have to live in a place that their, their abuse occurred. I could barely handle hearing my abuser's name without becoming over, being overcome with anxiety and a flow of negative emotions and an urge to drink myself into submission. If I had to continue to sleep in a place where my abuse occurred, I do not think I could have made it. I pray for those that have to sleep in a place where one of the most unspeakable things has happened to them. I urge each and every one of you to pass HB 375 today so that the survivors no longer have to question if they will have to sleep in ground zero of one of their most traumatic life experiences. College students, mothers, and daughters should not be forced to live in a place that represents such a traumatic time in their life. This is a step towards ensuring survivors on campuses like LSU can prevent re-traumatization at the hands of a landlord. This is a change in survivors' life that can mean a world of a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of you for, for being here and, and showing the courage to share your very uh, traumatic experiences with us. Um, and I think, the, I think we have one more student left, uh, Harris Quadir. Good morning, y'all. Um, it is still morning. <laughs> so um, my name is Harry Squidier. I'm currently in LSU Student Government Center for the College of Art and Design. Um, and I'm also, you know, with the recent uh, allegations of sexual assaults and um, scandals at LSU, I've been appointed to a committee to review these cases. But today I kind of come from a different perspective. Um, I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana, born and raised, been here for 21 years. And so um, my parents, both of them are actually landlords, and both of them kind of come from this background. Um, my father's a small business owner. He runs this real estate agency where they manage properties, real estate, leases, and I've worked over there in the summer. So I kind of come from that end as well. And so um, the first thing I had when I heard this coming was like, well, let me talk to my dad. You know, what does he say? And I talked to him, and he said, well, you know, how do we stop this from being abused, you know, because a lot of people do like to get out of their leases, you know, they want to move to a nicer place, um, get out of their lease, trying to find that loophole. And I was like, you know, this has become a loophole because this is our income. We're talking about, you know, the clothes on my back are put on by the rent that comes from 
these renters and lessees. And so I talked to him and we talked about it and I went back to um, to the legislation, I talked to Ms. Morgan, um, I talked to Ms. Allison, the legislative aide, and discussed it and you know, I looked through it and the legislation does really hold it for survivors only, um, making sure that survivors are um, the ones who are receiving the benefit of this legislation and it's not being abused. So I believe this part has been vetted. Um, I know a representative had a question regarding discrimination against women. Just working from uh, in an office and whenever we have applicants come in it is a business so you know you know it's, there's um, money you know we're losing here if we decline everyone we see so a lot of times it's you know background checks financial checks can they afford the place and so a lot of times discrimination is very um, not very easy to occur in these kind of scenarios so I don't really foresee just from my personal experiences I don't really foresee um, landlords or anyone discriminating against women for this new clause to be entered and I know we talked about um, you know are we opening up the Pandora's box are we opening up the can of worms but I think that you know 90 percent of uh, our, this is just my personal statistic this is not actually back but most um, most uh, landlords most uh, owners they usually do work out the cases they're not always as awful as we um, you know seem to see sometimes in the media however um, it's that 10%, it's that small case where, you know, sexual assault victims are being forced and required to live over money. And I think money and greed should not be a reason for us to um, perpetrate people's mental health and um, allow for people to deteriorate over these causes. So I do encourage the committee to um, take a look at this thoroughly, and I do think it's in the right place and I think um, the way it's going forward and the way it's written um, truly protects landlords and victims and so um, that is the perspective I come from as a child of um, landlords and so thank you for your time and go Tigers. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right um, uh, let's bring back uh, Representative Freeman and, and also hear from uh, Katie Hunter -Low Lowry please. And Mr. Chairman, first, I would like to really thank all the survivors who took the time to sit before and share their personal stories, because that takes a tremendous amount of courage. And um, I know you all know that, but I just personally felt the need that I need to make sure and that I they think, know how much I, I appreciate their courage. And, and I think I think I can speak on behalf of the committee that we also all thank them for being there and showing showing that courage um all right uh, miss lowry hey, hi good morning. good morning again um uh, my name is katie hunter lowry i'm here on behalf of the louisiana survivors for reform coalition um you know we're we are in agreement with all that has been said about how this bill would financially emotionally um, in terms of safety, support the needs of survivors. And uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank everyone who has spoken. It's a really difficult thing to do. Um, you know, we see in our membership a huge range of folks in age, income, location, and this bill will benefit students for sure and also folks across Louisiana. Um, we really appreciate about this bill that it supports survivors outside of the criminal legal system. The vast majority of sexual assault survivors don't report to police. There's numerous reasons for that. Um, and we clearly can't incarcerate our way out of sexual violence or Louisiana would be the safest place in the world. Um, so folks in Louisiana Survivors for Reform talk about how negative their interactions with police and the criminal legal system can be this bill gives folks an option um, that is more creative and more thoughtful as to what survivors need. So um, we we really appreciate that. Um, one other note on that is just that the in Louisiana, the Crime Victims Reparations Fund requires that you file a police report within 72 hours to receive any compensation. Um, and so there are all of these limitations for survivors who don't want to go through a trial or report to police. And um, this bill really emphasizes that there are other ways to provide safety for folks. And thank you so much, Representative Freeman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Landry for a question. Hi, thanks, uh, Rep Freeman. I, I like this bill and plan to continue to support it 
as it moves through the process. Um, but I have one question that I'm not sure if you're the best person um, to ask this, but um, what is a tenant's option if a landlord refuses to let them out? And you may have answered this when I went in the, the side room. Um, wait. Or maybe, is, or maybe Maxwell or someone can answer. Let, let me if, let Morgan answer that because you're asking what is the option if the landlord says no, I, I like I don't believe you, or I or I don't agree, or or doesn't know about the law, or well, they um, have to provide documentation, and so this law is going to allow. I mean, at this point, right now, if a landlord won't let them out, there's nothing that um, can really be done except for trying to negotiate with the landlord. And this law puts that documentation into place so that they can bring that documentation to the landlord and say this is a law that. So should this pass out of committee and through the process and get signed by the governor, this law will will allow for it. And Morgan Lamondre again, I think I, I understand your question. So if they simply just say, no, I'm not going to follow this law, I think at that point, um, really what this presents is if then they moved out, I mean, the lease ends by operation of this law. But once they moved out, if then the landlord would start eviction proceedings, this would essentially be set up as a defense to eviction proceedings. Um, as part of our compromise with the apartment association, this does not start a new cause of action. You can't sue the landlord, but it definitely, unfortunately for survivors, if, if they, you know, just then abandoned, it would be more set up as a defense to eviction. So, so as long as they have the paperwork required in here, if they have to go to city court or whatever, they show the same paperwork. Correct. So it, it's not like they'll be able to just go and sue over them not letting mm -hmm. them out. But the way it's set up is that at least then they wouldn't be evicted, like have an eviction on their record for no longer paying rent and being there. So, does that answer your question? Well, yeah. Well, hopefully the eviction and all that would be expunged or removed well it it would set up to where they could not be officially evicted right but the record something he and i have talked about i'll ask maxwell about it later thanks thank you uh representative jenkins for a question yeah thank you mr chairman now let me thank you uh representative for bringing the bill you know i i, I believe the bill is well thought out i think it's narrowly tailored and uh, it certainly makes sense to me that if something has occurred and a person is living there that this is not you know some flimsy reason to get out the lease i i think it's a very real situation that needs to have a, a real solution to it so uh mr chairman at the appropriate time if that has not yet been done uh, i would move favorable i think it's a bill that needs to continue to work its way through this process and I know there may be some other questions people have, but somewhere along the line, I think those questions could be answered. I think uh, from what I've seen, you all have tried to reach out to all of the stakeholders. And uh, so it's not just a, a way to just break your lease and walk away. I think you have some genuine concerns that it ought to be considered by everybody. And this is the appropriate time. Uh, the board is clear. Um, and I'll just read uh, the rest of the cards that we have. Uh, present will provide information if requested Sean Cassidy Louisiana Foundation against sexual assault uh, we have Michael Cahoon uh, not wishing to speak present and in support the promise of justice initiative uh, not wishing to speak present and in support Tammy Sponge the Apartment Association of Louisiana Latasha Davis not wishing to speak present and in support Louisiana Coalition against domestic violence uh, not wishing to speak and, uh, and present and in support Susan East Nelson Louisiana Partnership for Children and Families we also uh, all received a, an email in support from Brandy Melissa which uh, that will be uh, uh, recorded as uh, su in support and that's available for all of you and it will be in the records uh, so with that um, Representative Freeman, uh, you go ahead and close on your bill. Well, I, I would just like to ask to move for favorable passage. I appreciate everybody's time and um, sensitivity to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, Representative Jenkins has moved to report House Bill 375, 
with amendments. Are there any objections to reporting House Bill 375 with amendments? Seeing none, House Bill 375 is reported with amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.